Good morning or good afternoon once again, brothers and sisters. Uh, in our final discussion this afternoon, uh, we note in our first discussion, of course, we talked about the principle from John 17 that we must know the only true and living God and Jesus Christ whom he hath sent if we are to be true disciples of the Lord. And that part of that knowing, not the only thing, but part of that knowing is we have to have a working understanding of the true plan and purpose of God with this earth, as we discussed in our second section session, which involves God's glory, his ultimate plan being his glory being manifested in all the earth in a glorified, redeemed people upon this earth, not necessarily for our own salvation's sake, but that his glory and honor and majesty might be manifested through all the earth. This is the great plan and purpose of the deity for this earth. And so having considered those two topics, we, has, we have as disciples of the Lord, if you will, a choice. We each have a choice. And that choice is set forth in these verses that we just read from Deuteronomy chapter 30, where Israel of old was told that I have set before thee life and death. Choose life that thou mayest live. And so we want to consider that principle and some of the concepts set forth here in this 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, such as verse 16, and that I command thee this day to love Yahweh the Elohim, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgment, that thou mayest live and multiply, and Yahweh thy Elohim shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. We know that Israel, to a large extent, failed in that and brought upon themselves curse, cursings. And so the exhortation to us is to learn from the examples that are set forth therein. So we'll consider in our final session uh, these principles surrounding the choice that we each have as disciples for life or death that has been set before us. <laughs> We'd like to begin back in the New Testament where our master taught his disciples to pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. These are familiar words which we all know and we've all repeated many times in the Lord's Prayer. But how many times during our repetition of these words of our Lord have we taken the trouble to ponder the implications of what we have just been saying. We may properly follow his teaching in addressing the throne of the Most High by calling him our Father. But does this manner of address necessarily certify that we truly are his children? If it did, God would have millions of Christian children presently throughout this world who recite this prayer, and we know that that simply is not the case. If, however, we do qualify as his children, do we not owe to him all the sincere love and humble reverence that we are capable of both generating and demonstrating? But it is impossible for us to love him with the intensity that he demanded of his Hebrew children, the Jews, in the absence of our truly knowing him and of clearly understanding his ways, as we've been discussing this day. Furthermore, we need to understand his expectations of us in the form of true filial obedience to our God. In the name of reason, how can we come to know our Creator's will and character other than from what he has chosen to reveal to us of himself through his word? We often hear, we often hear people who have relatively little knowledge of the Bible say something to this effect, I can sincerely worship God according to the dictates of my own conscience. I can sincerely worship God according to the dictates of my own conscience. 
This may serve to satisfy their desire to regard themselves as righteous or spiritual, quote unquote, and thus to feel comfortable in catering to their own human wills and desires. However, this in no way offers proof from the scriptures that they are satisfying God's expectations of them, nor that their self-conceived services, however solemn and impressive to themselves, are rendering pleasure to him who at that very moment holds their present lives in his almighty hands. No member of the human race, whether living or dead, has known our heavenly father and his will so thoroughly and completely and intimately as did God's only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking for himself, Jesus set straight the Samaritan woman who thought that she and her people understood how to worship God. This is found in John 4, 22 and 23. Ye worship ye know not what? We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Most sincere people of the Christian community at large and the world around us regard the statements of Jesus as inspired and authoritative. Thus, his statement to the Samaritan woman that we've just read clearly discounts any form of human worship that is not strictly in accordance with the Father's inspired pronouncements through his son, his prophets, and his apostles. Such forms of human, humanly devised worship or worshiping God according to the dictates of my own conscience, that type of concept, are unrelated to the salvation that the Father offers to mankind. Both during his earthly ministry and in his present glory, Jesus has said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. We need to hear in all matters of our service to God, the inspired words of God not those words of uninspired men. Furthermore, we shall not have ears to hear unless our hearts are inclined to the truth of those words. And so we cannot worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. That's not scriptural. We have to worship God in accordance with the dictates of his conscience as revealed in the scriptures. Yes, brothers and sisters, truly he has set before us life or death. It is from God's words and from them alone that we can learn how perfect, true, and merciful are God's ways. As he inspired his prophet to write of him in the 103rd Psalm, verses 8 to 14, Yahweh is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Could the characteristics of a loving father be more truly or more beautifully stated than these words from the psalmist? All this mercy and forbearance is described of the one infinite in power to harm his enemies or his disobedient children, while being at the same time spotless in his own purity and righteous in all his acts. We may note from this third psalm that we just read an important qualification of those who would be recipients of this loving mercy and forgiveness. It is made clear in this 103rd psalm that they are restricted, the forgiveness and mercy of God is restricted to those that fear him, to those that fear him. And the form of fear here that we're talking about is not 
fear in the sense of an utter paralyzing terror, but rather a loving reverential fear based upon accurate knowledge of the Father and upon a reasoning faith in him. This leaves out of hope for salvation those who neither know the only true God, as we've discussed in John 17, nor choose to follow anything but the dictates of their own consciences. This proud self-esteem and the arrogance of irreverent mankind are in the eyes of deity an utter abomination. Yes, indeed, brothers and sisters, he has set before us life and death. Our Heavenly Father, brothers and sisters, has not left himself without abundant witness to his goodness and mercy. As the Apostle Paul pointed out to the pagan Greeks when talking with them on Mars Hill in Athens, speaking to them of the Almighty, who to them was the unknown God, Paul says in Acts 17, verses 26 through 28, 28 and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We notice from Paul's statement a distinct difference between the ways in which God had dealt with the Gentiles up to Paul's day and the way in which he had dealt with his Hebrew children. The Gentiles had not been commanded to love the majesty in the heavens from whom they had long, long ago turned away from and about whom they had forgotten for over 4,000 years. Incidentally, Paul warned them that the time of God's overlooking, overlooking of Gentile disregard for him was now over in the, in the book of Acts, and that he was henceforth calling upon all men everywhere to repent, it's Acts 17.30. God's attitude towards his own chosen nation and toward their responsibility to him, as revealed in Deuteronomy and elsewhere in the law, was quite another matter. They were children of his deliberate choice and on the basis of his covenant with their fathers, unlike the Gentiles. This unique position of the Jews in God's concern is expressed in Amos chapter 3 and verse 2, where we read, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore will I punish you for all your iniquities. God did not choose to permit his people to walk in their own ways. As he, had allowed, as he had allowed the Gentiles for so long. Their relationship to him was intended to be one of a father with his children. God had abundantly demonstrated to his people his fatherly care. We read in Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Yes, brothers and sisters, God had informed Israel repeatedly of their highly privileged position in his loving concern. He also warned them repeatedly of the danger to them of turning their back upon him and of being unfaithful to his covenant with them. The Old Testament abounds with his remonstrations with his people and what he termed the quarrel of my covenant in Leviticus 26, verse 25. And again, in Exodus 19, which we refer to faithfulness to God's covenant was to be the condition upon which their receipt uh, would be their receipt of his most favored nation status rested. If Israel had any doubt about this fact, God very explicitly warned them in great detail in Leviticus 26 and later in uh, Deuteronomy 28 
as to how their national and personal fortunes would change greatly upon breaking his covenant from what they would otherwise be so long as they were faithful to it. And we know, of course, that sadly occurred. Yes, indeed, he set before them, brothers and sisters, life and death. But let us return from the consideration of the conditions for Israel's national favor as God's son, whom he had called out of Egypt, to our own status as being also of God's children, whom he has called out of Egyptian darkness to be his disciples. As Paul expressed in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If then by reason of this illumination, we are truly God's children, as we proclaim that we are when we recite the Lord's Prayer that we opened up with, we stand in a position very comparable, if you will, to that of Israel, though not under the Mosaic Covenant, but under the everlasting covenant ratified in our Lord's own blood. Thus, God has every right as our Father in heaven to command us, his children, to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strengths. This may appear to us to be a tall order, to love him with all our soul, all our mind, all of our strength. It may appear indeed to be a tall order, yet God required the same of his beloved son. The only human being able to fulfill that commandment perfectly. But our failure to do so does not in any way make the commandment unreasonable. If God is truly our Father, it rather emphasizes the unworthiness of human nature for sonship to God, except on the basis of God's own mercy and grace. So our failure does not make the commandment in any way unreasonable, but it rather emphasizes the unworthiness of human nature for sonship to God. It's only through his grace and mercy, mercy that we can ever attain to that. It also points out very clearly not only our desperate need for that forgiveness and mercy, but also the need for our willing, humble, and cheerful acknowledgement of this need. It virtually demands our extreme gratitude to such an exceeding gracious Heavenly Father as we have. Truly, brothers and sisters, he has set before us life and death. Recognition of our debt to God, of course, goes against the grain of human pride, does it not? Our most serious weakness and one that could be for us, for us all a most dangerous pitfall, human pride. Our treacherous pride can even trick us into boasting as to how very humble and obedient we are, thus implying that many of our peers are not so. Religion, as humans conceive of it, ministers to this hypocritical form of pride. History demonstrates this in the forms of monasticism practiced over the centuries by most of the world's religions. Confusion has deluded its practitioners into inflicting pain and injury upon their bodies, supposing that it is evidence of their outstanding piety. Others deprive themselves of the comfort of, nor uh, of a normal manner of living that their creator has provided for them. Even the hypocritical Jewish scribes and Pharisees we're not that foolish. Moreover, the Apostle Paul warned the Colossians, and this is in Colossians 2, uh, he, 2 18 through 23, against being led astray from the simplicity that is in Christ through seeking to display their assumed righteousness before men. Verse 23, and this is from the Revised Standard Version. It's an interesting rendering. Paul writes to these Colossians, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting rigor of devotion and self-abasement 
and severity to the body, but they are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh. No value in checking the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, we cannot beat the natural lusts out of our bodies. Our attempts to do so only intensify them. Lust will only leave our minds and hearts by their being starved out through exercising our thoughts and our bodies in constructed ways surrounding the word of God. Moreover, we need to be aware that perhaps the most unyielding of all lusts is that of seeking to gain credit or glory for one's own self, again, human pride. It was this drive that motivated the enemies of Jesus to rid themselves of him because his words and deeds showed them up to be the people for what they truly were and who they truly were, namely a disobedient people. When people indulge those motives to the limit, they can easily become murderers in the heart, if not also in word or deed. They forget that God knows accurately what is in their hearts, and he knows accurately what is in our hearts, brothers and sisters. Yes, truly, he has set before us life and death. When we pause to think about it a bit more, we can see how utterly foolish it is for us to attempt to promote ourselves in the eyes of our fellows. It merely demonstrates that we have little or no faith in the judgment of our Father and of His Son to recognize our true worth. They know full well how worthy we are, and no one can misrepresent us to our divine judges, how worthy we are or how worthy, unworthy we are. No one can misrepresent us to the divine judges, God and his son. We would do far better for ourselves by relaxing our anxieties about how we appear to others and to develop the faith, trust, and love that we owe to our heavenly father. We could then leave any false impressions regarding us that may lurk in the midst of our peers to be dealt with according to the infinite wisdom of the great judge. We have described the divine commandment to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength as a very tall order. There can scarcely be any fair denial of this estimate. It is a tall order for the flesh. Yet it is clearly a divine command by the Father in heaven to his adopted children, to his disciples. On the basis of his own reasoning, some people would consider such a command to love as unreasonable. They might claim that love has to be earned, not ordered. That love has to be earned, not ordered by God. But who has more thoroughly earned our debt of love than our creator and our father in heaven? Jesus himself pointed this out in Matthew 5, uh, verse 44 and 45, showing how good and merciful God is both to the just and the unjust. He admonishes us to emulate the Father's practical love that, quote, ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, that we may be the children of our Father, which is in heaven. Much of the problem of loving God that we emotionally charged humans encounter may lie not only in our self-centered pride, but also in the fact that we tend to think of love in primarily emotional terms, that is, of an emotional attracted toward others. In our obeying our Lord's command to love our enemies, it seems that we are not required to have an emotional attraction toward our enemies, just as an example to try to explain the concept, and we're talking here about agape love, which is the self-sacrificing form of love. He commands us to love our enemies, and that is not uh, does not require us to have some sort of an emotional attraction toward our enemies, but rather to observe the Lord's teaching commonly spoken of as the golden rule. Do unto others as thou would have done to yourself. This is only reasonable, practical love for the Father's creatures in emulation of that father's practical love toward them, practical love for God's creation in emulating the father's practical love towards them and practicing in ourselves. 
This our Lord demonstrated during his own earthly ministry. Even then, he had many bitter enemies, we know, but he took no practical revenge upon them at that time, at his first advent. In spite of his harmless behavior, Jesus manifested no emotional attraction toward them. On the contractor, he denounced their wicked ways in scathing terms and foretold of their exclusion from the kingdom of God. But yet in all that he did, he loved his enemies. Think of his final words on the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. We in no way deny that our love for God can and should involve our emotions. We're not suggesting that. Certainly our love for God can and should involve our emotions. Emotion should, however, be only one element in spiritual love. True and enduring spiritual love, the agape form of love, must involve practical virtues. These should, these should be in accord with what we are taught clearly in God's word. Spiritual love or agape love can begin with acquiring a true understanding of and a sincere appreciation of what God is, as we've been talking about, knowing God and his son, Jesus Christ. For we read these words from Paul in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Thus the pleasing and ultimate loving of God begins with active belief and sincere seeking of God in spirit and in truth. Merely to go through established formalities and routines of worship does not show forth love of God but rather a seeking for approval of self in the eyes of our peers. Our Lord said this to his hypocritical enemies in John 5, verses 41 and 42. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that he ha ye have not the love of God in you. Ye have not the love of God in you. Finally, we have in John's writings, the most nearly exhaustive treatment in scripture on the subject of loving of both God and man. It is fitting that this clarification of the subject of spiritual or agape love should come from the pen of the disciple whom Jesus loved, namely John. What John's writings reveal concerning spiritual love serves to bring the proper focus upon Paul's inspired essay on love in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Jesus says in John 14, verses 21 to 24, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. Here we see the closeness between our Lord and his Father, both of whom are to be loved and served in the same way. We have not yet been granted the privilege of beholding either of them, but our Lord has said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Evidently, the loving of God to the degree that he commands begins with the purification of our own hearts, for then our ability to understand how truly lovable God is and our love for him will grow as our own hearts increase in purity. John again wrote in one of his letters in 1 John 5 and 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And so it is a tall order. Being disciples of our Lord is a tall order keeping these principles set forth to Israel long ago as examples for us is a tall order. But we must do so as disciples of the Lord, for he has set before us life or death. Let us, brothers and sisters, strive with all of our might together and choose life. Thank you.